Hello, everyone. So, uh, uh, welcome to this uh, conference by uh, Gemma Kellan this morning. This is really, uh, I have to say, uh, a big honor for us to welcome Jay. Um, Jay, uh, in a sense, uh, is a legend, uh, especially for people like me um, uh, who've been working at the frontiers of cognitive sciences and artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, because not only he's made across the years a many fundamental uh, contribution to cognitive sciences by building AI models, and especially connectionist models, but also because uh, he's had a pretty important mm -hmm. historical role uh, in artificial intelligence. So today we are in the world where everyone in the news is speaking about AI every day, and, uh, and the AI in which people are talking about are based on uh, uh, variations of uh, uh, what can be called uh, uh, distributed uh, learning architectures, uh, neural networks. Um, but this success uh, and the presence of neural networks in AI has not always been uh, there. Uh, if you look back uh, in, the in the history of AI, there was a bunch of uh, very uh, brilliant people in the 50s uh, who created AI and cybernetics and also created many branches of AI with many different ideas. Um, a few of them, very early on, starting even in the 40s, uh, proposed the idea that maybe we could be a machine that mimic the way the brain is working by building abstract models of uh, neurons and neural networks and trying to see how we could build uh, from the ground up forms of uh, cognition uh, that, that would share uh, properties with um, animals and humans in particular, and, and, and actually some of them thought it was the building those machine was a way to make progress towards understanding animal and human cognition. But actually very quickly uh, after those first neural networks were invented, there was a number of people who actually uh, uh, argued that it was a, the wrong way to go. Uh, actually some people even proved that neural networks would never be able to work and solve any interesting problems. Uh, that was actually a bit like uh, uh, in the 19th century, be, before the, the, the bicycle, as we know it, uh, uh, was invented. Uh, some people mathematically prove a bicycle could not, uh, could not run. Yeah, yeah you, you have this proof in the scientific literature. Uh, and, so, and some neural networks like, were like more or less uh, put on the side for many years, and, and, and AI was dominated by this kind of uh, symbolic approaches, uh, uh, traditional uh, approaches uh, viewing uh, cognition as a system of manipulation of symbols. Uh, but in the 80s, there was a bunch of people uh, who actually believed in the interest of neural networks and probably uh, going back to the initial motivation of building the neural network, which was to model human cognition. Um, and I believe that uh, Jay McLean was one of those very few people believing in this approach. And not only he believed in this approach, but and had a, a number of amazing ideas to build those models, but uh, with a, a, a few colleagues, including uh, uh, David Homelhart, uh, uh, he actually built uh, a team that became very well known in the world called the Parallel Distributed Processing Research Group. Uh, and they wrote a book uh, that's called the PDP book, that at this time served as a kind of textbook uh, for uh, re-explaining to the scientific community what was the concept, what were the ideas, what was the interest, what was the potential of neural networks. Uh, and it probably played uh, the role of igniting again the interest for neural networks. And in this group, there were a, a few other key people. Uh, there was also Geoff Hinton, uh, which uh, I guess uh, you know uh, uh, was one of the key inventors of uh, backprop and the use of backprop in neural networks, which is at the heart of today's revolution. Uh, in, in deep learning. And Geoff, uh, in turn, also worked a lot with uh, Yeshua Benjo and Yann uh, Lequin in, in the years after. Uh, but we can safely say that much of this dynamics was uh, ignited by, by the effort of this, this group of researchers uh, uh, in which Jay was at the center. So, uh, so that's why I'm saying that Jay uh, uh, can be considered as a legend, at least for people like me. Uh, and we would probably have a different history of the sciences and of AI today uh, if this group may have not been there. So we don't know, we cannot repeat the story, but uh, <laughs> that's probably the case. 
And, and Jay has not stopped, uh, of course, his contribution uh, to the 80s. He's, he's continued to make amazing contribution uh, to both cognitive science and AI. In cognitive science, uh, in building uh, uh, models of um, things such as uh, reading, uh, speech, perception and, uh, speech perception, and more generally language understanding. Um, uh, influencing a lot of cognitive science, especially in the approach of using computational models uh, to make progress. But he's also uh, uh, very recently made a number of uh, new contributions to uh, understanding, trying to understand better the, the fundamental mechanisms that are at play in transformers, for example, to, to explain their capabilities. Uh, and that's why also beyond uh, uh, his, uh, his job as a professor at Stanford, he is also working with Google DeepMind. Uh, actually, uh, with collaboration with uh, probably my favorite team at DeepMind, which is a team with uh, Felix Hill, uh, Andrew Lampinen, who was one of his PhD students, uh, and another great uh, people. Um, and I, I, I guess today will uh, explain us uh, his current vision of the future uh, as a result of this ongoing work uh, with this great community. So thank you, Jay, for coming. Um, thank you. Okay, so uh, the introduction sets me up, I think, very nicely for the beginning of my talk. Uh, so let's uh, just dive right into it here. So the question we were asking back when we started the PDP group around 1980 was, what sort of a system do we need if we're going to model intelligence. And uh, in the 80s, we argued that the AI systems of that day would never work. Um, and we proposed a set of ideas called parallel distributed processing as an alternative. So this is the cover of the first volume of our two volume uh, work. This volume was uh, sort of mostly focused on, it says, foundations, if you could read the small print there, basic theoretical ideas, sort of laying the groundwork, the concept of a distributed representation, which Jeff Hinton wrote. Uh, I myself was primarily the leader of the second volume, which applied these ideas to several domains in human cognition. Um, I come from a psychological background initially in my motivations have always been to understand aspects of the way we function as human thinkers uh, and human, well, not just thinkers, but, you know, people who uh, achieve their goals and somehow or other make progress in learning and discovering new things. So, but we propose these ideas in a, as an alternative and, uh, you know, the part of the story that um, we, we haven't heard so far is, is more that there was this huge backlash to these ideas. There was already the backlash rejecting uh, Rosenblatt's ideas with the proofs that uh, Pierre referred to, but um, the backlash against parallel distributed processing was very, very strong indeed. And um, you know, although lots of people bought copies of this book, the models based on the ideas that were proposed at that time and for at least uh, 20 years afterwards were not, you know, they had limitations. They couldn't really do real things in the real world with real inputs, right? And so around the turn of the century, um, I was finding it very difficult to get students to come to my lab and get grants to continue to do this kind of work. And people like Josh Tenenbaum were telling us that we really needed to get rid of this neural network stuff and replace it with something else. But about 10 years after that, all of it began to change. So I want to just make sure that we're all on common ground with what the principles were that we were describing in that work. Uh, I'm doing this to sort of set you up with the idea that these are amazingly useful and powerful principles. 
but maybe something's still missing. So we want to understand what they are so we can understand what's still missing, okay? All right, so principles of parallel distributed processing basically stated that processing in a cognitive system or the brain of a, of a human or an animal occurs via propagation of graded activation signals among simple processing units. At the time, I was a strong proponent of the idea that there were continuous valued activations and signals that were being passed uh, and gradually building up across stages, like as we, as we uh, process the visual world through many stages of the visual system, for example, uh, which was antithetical to the kind of discrete symbolic approach at the time. We also argued uh, in the paper written primarily by Jeff that representations in, in, in our minds, in, in uh, PDP systems, are distributed patterns of activation across these units. So when I'm looking out and seeing all of you there, there's patterns of activation in many different parts of my brain, which are my active representation of what it is that I'm seeing. So what's the knowledge in the system that allows those patterns to arise in ways that are useful and appropriate? Well, the knowledge is in the connections, right? There's only processing units and connections between them. You're looking at it. Okay, they have graded values, these connection weights, and the units have graded activation values. Um, and the knowledge that allows a pattern on the input to produce the appropriate pattern deeper in the network is in the connections between the units. There's no like lookup table where you find out you see an animal with four legs and you look at, oh, animals with cat, cat has four legs. You know, that's not how it works, right? There's just connections in the neural networks that make you, the concept of, oh, that's a cat arises in your mind because the connections propagate from that image to that activation of a representation of, of a cat. Uh, so the knowledge is in the connections and how do we learn? Well, we learn by adjusting the strengths of those connections, right? So when you train a convolutional neural network, for example, to do object classification, you train it on hundreds of thousands or millions of images, gradually adjusting the strengths of the connections until it gets better and better at performing the task of mapping from these images onto the labels of the categories involved. So, that idea, okay, the learning curve through adjusting the connections was already there from Donald Hebb. But what Jeff Hinton brought to the table, and I mean that literally, I can remember when he presented this idea to us in one of the PDP meetings in uh, 1982, was the idea that we shouldn't think about learning as something where we worked out the learning rule by just thinking what neurons might do individually. What we should do is try to figure out how to learn by finding out what it would take to kind of get the model to sort of do better at matching some objective function. Okay, so we do gradient descent in order to improve the network's ability to produce the right output given the input. We present an input, we propagate activation forward, we get our outputs, and then we have some sort of teaching signal. Maybe we're predicting the next item in a sequence. Maybe we're predicting a label. Maybe we're predicting the activations of other neurons in the network. We, where those targets come from, we don't know, but we're using these target signals as signals that tell us when to change the strengths of these connections. This is a slow, gradual, gradient-based process. Or maybe we get a reward signal. We got a drop of juice by pressing a lever, okay? And so that sends a signal through the system that allows us to adjust the strengths. Maybe whenever we get a reward that was unexpected, we increase the strengths of the connections uh, that led to that response. But it's, again, it's a gradient-based process, right? We're, 
making, we're taking derivatives to figure out exactly how to make the changes in this network. So it was biologically inspired a little bit by the neurons and the, you know, by what you actually see when you look at the brain. But the learning rule, of course, has always been controversial, right? Well, how does the brain do that? How does it find those derivatives? Nevertheless, that was the approach. Okay. So the paper by Roland Hart Hinton and Williams appeared in 1986. And Nature sort of introduced the backpropagation learning algorithm and showed how it could be used to learn interesting representations through this gradient-based learning process. Okay. So how are these systems different from the old-fashioned AI systems? The early systems depend on symbols with category labels and structure-sensitive rules. So I, I want to just place this idea in your mind as a contrast. Okay, so in linguistics, we have this classic example from Chomsky, where he says, you know, if I say to you a sentence like, colorless green ideas sleep furiously, the first time Chomsky said that, nobody had ever heard that sentence before, probably. How do you know it's a sentence in the English language? Well, he didn't think it meant anything. He thought you did it by recognizing that it consisted of a noun phrase, which consists of two adjectives, colorless, green, and one noun, ideas. Like a tall um, blue bird or something like that, right? A noun phrase. Followed by a verb phrase. Sleep, verb, adverb. That's a verb phrase. Very simple rules. Very abstractly stated. If you have the right category labels on the words, then they fit those rules, and that tells you that that's a sentence. That's the paradigm of good old-fashioned AI. You have rules and struck patterns of arrangement of categorized symbols, like nouns, verbs, things like that. In logic, you have rules of the same kind. You have modus ponens, which says, if you know that P implies Q, and you know that P is true, then you can conclude that Q is true. Right? For any propositions, P and Q, it doesn't matter what they are. As long as they're propositions, then this follows. In mathematics, we have this all the time. We have rules like, you know, the uh, distributive law, which says for any numbers A, B, and C, maybe I should say real numbers, uh, A times B plus C is equal to A times B plus A times C. So that's an example of this. And mathematics is actually based on these kinds of rules, right? So today's models don't use these things inside them to compute at all. And the core of the critique in 1988 by Fodor and Polition was that we needed these things in order to make sure that our thought was systematic and followed logically from its premises. Um, so, it couldn't be done. It's sort of like proving that the bicycle wouldn't go. Uh, so, who was right? Um, oh, I'm not going to go through this. I need to move on. <laughs> These models didn't work because they were too brittle. Um, they missed out on um, capturing nuances and things like that. Uh, I, I guess I can't uh, refrain from saying that uh, when I was uh, young, I went to school in Switzerland and I was taught primarily in English, but I studied French, and I also studied German, and so I memorized things in lists of words and what, you know, um, you know, the passé parfait du sous-gentif or something like that. Maybe I even made that up. I don't know, but uh, there were tables of these uh, French tenses in the book that I had to memorize, but I couldn't speak French, right? I just knew these explicit rules, but they didn't help me speak. If you want to learn how to speak, you have to immerse yourself in the act of engagement in the process. And that's maybe this is part of the reason why I never thought those rules were any use, right? Uh, in any case, yeah, so it's gradual learning through immersion that allows us to get to the point where we appreciate the subtleties, we 
we know how to deal with the exceptions along with the regular cases, and we started to demonstrate that in some of our models in the PDP books. Um, so, for example, we had a model of the past tense of English, which captured the human ability to uh, not only learn regular patterns like um, love, the past tense of love is loved. You add a D at the end. The past tense of uh, like is liked. You add a T at the end. But what about the exceptions? Like the past tense of sleep is slept. Well, it's sort of like liked. You add this t sound, but you also change the vowel, right? So the idea was that most of the exceptions actually have some of the regularity in them, and the neural network is capable of kind of being sensitive to the regularity while also adapting sufficiently to be able to tweak those regularities in a nuanced way and capture the exceptionality. So the, this, these at least were my fundamentals <coughs> continuing to think that we needed to um, think in terms of these neural network-like systems, even if there were things that uh, seemed beyond their capability and that they didn't seem systematic enough to many people. Okay, so who was right? Well, in some ways, today's AI systems are pretty smart. They function well enough to be in use every day for speech recognition, language translation, many other things. They exceed human performance in games like Go and Chess, are getting more and more powerful every day. In some ways, neural networks like this one are way smarter than me. I would never be, nobody is able to beat Alpha Zero's uh, ability to play chess, Go, or other games uh, of this kind. Humans have been completely surpassed in this regard. about large language models. So Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, said these things in uh, November 30th, just as GPT-3 was being released. And this was also the same day that I gave the first version of this talk at the, uh, the NeurIPS workshop that was organized by some of the members of uh, Perry's team here. Anyway, uh, he said, language interfaces are going to be a big deal, I think. You talk to the computer, and you get what you want for increasingly complex definitions of want. This is an early demo of what's possible. Still a lot of limitations, very much a research release. It's going to make a lot of mistakes. Uh, but soon you'll be able to have powerful assistants that talk to you, answer questions, give advice. Later you can have something that goes off and does tasks for you. Eventually you can have something that goes off and discovers new knowledge for you. But this same interface works, interface works for all of that. This is something that sci-fi really got right. Until we have direct neural inf interfaces wired to our neurons in our brain, language interfaces are probably the next best. So is he right about that? Um, so. The next thing I'm going to tell you about is the main innovation that has been at the heart of at least the language models. It's not part of AlphaGo, really, or those models, but it is the innovation that has been at the core of the success of language models. I'm sure some of you know about this, but it's worth being clear about it, um, exactly what is this core computational idea. And uh, I'm going to share it with you now on the next slide. Uh, and I'm going to imagine uh, something that was very interesting to Dave Rummelhart and me in the early days of PDP. How do we use context to help us interpret the meaning of a word? And I chose the word bat here. Uh, it's ambiguous in English. It could be a small animal that flies out of a cave, perhaps, or around a church tower in, in the, at dusk or it might be uh, something that you swing at a ball. So uh, when you hear the word bat in a sentence, how do you interpret it? What's the mechanism by which you figure out which of those meanings is intended? So according to this innovation, 
you have the prior context available to you uh, in the form of patterns of activation, vectors of activation values, in slots, one for each of the previous words in the sentence. Okay, so we have John hit the ball with the. That's the previous words in the sentence, and now we have the word bat. We have these representations. How do we use uh, the word bat together with these representations to gain some information about how to interpret this word in this context? Well, the idea is we issue a query uh, that we compare to representations in these slots. Okay, so sometimes we have a separate slots for the keys, the things that match the queries, and the values that get returned. But my slightly more general version of this is that the query could be any subset of some vector, and then what we return would be the rest of the vector. So we're going to think about that version of it. So I have these vectors, and uh, I present a query. I find out what in the in these uh, of which of these patterns matches it best. And in this case, it's hit. I imagine that it's useful to disambiguate the word bat to find what the verb was in the sentence. If the verb is hit, it might be something you use to hit something. If it's fly, it might be that this is the flying animal. Okay, so we're going to look. Where's a verb? What's a can I find a verb here? Well, hit, there's a sub-pattern that's sort of verbiness. Uh, there's a little bit of similarity with the word with here, so relational terms are a little verby in my way of thinking. And so these are the two that match best. This one matches way better than this one, so we get a strong similarity for those two and not much for anything else. And then we compute weights. The weights have to add up to one, and they sort of focus the uh, attention, if you like, on this best matches. So uh, the weight is strongest for hit. Uh, and a little bit, you can maybe see that there's a slight bit of green here for this. Uh, so we weight each of these vectors by their weight. And then we add them up and we get a weighted attention vector, uh, which is the answer to our query. And maybe it says, this verb is uh, one that involves hitting something, um, maybe with something. <laughs> and uh, uh, so one of the things that I want you to notice about this is that this is parallel distributed processing. Okay, We're computing dot products of vectors with other vectors on a massive scale. Uh, reading papers about context windows that are 30,000 tokens long or something, right? 30,000 words of context or something like that to find something in there that's relevant. Um, and, uh, but it's all these very simple computations that we could do with neuron-like processing units. Uh, and, and really, it's just a, a slight adjustment of you know exactly how you organize the the vector uh, uh, computations in the network beyond the original ideas. Crucially, there are connection weight matrices that determine what these queries are and what the representation vectors are, and those are learned using gradient descent. Doing what? predicting the next word in the text primarily, right? That's the core um, learning driver of large language models. The large language models are PDP systems on steroids, if you like. Uh, probably the brain can't implement context windows of 30,000 tokens, or even in my view, more than like maybe 15 or 20 ish. Uh, and that's part of uh, the things that I'm kind of interested in. But um, this, it's still completely parallel distributed processing, obeying all of those principles we've talked about before, just organizing the computation in a, in a slightly different way and keeping track of all these representations in the network. Okay, um, so. I'm not going to go into the detail here, but this sort of just brings out that the 
transformer module in which these things are embedded is are basically a neural network, um, just like the one I showed you before, using a ReLU nonlinearity usually, and then this multi-headed attention uses these uh, weight matrices corresponding to the queries, the keys, and the values that allow the representation of each word to both issue queries to the context and also provide keys and values so that other things in the context can learn, can query it. And um, there are two kinds of these models, right? There's the forward-going GPT-style model where uh, at each time step you are able to query all, all the past context, but nothing, nothing ahead of you. It's kind of like you're listening to a sequence of words and predicting what's going to be said next, right, from the context, or what I thought of as really being PDP on steroids, the bidirectional transformer model of BERT, in which the queries, keys, and values are operating in both directions in a sentence. So if we have a sentence like, he walked to the bank and deposited a check, that information at the end would tell us whether it was a financial institution or the bank of a river, okay? So it, bidirectional is really parallel distributed processing in that everything is influencing the processing of everything else in a way that allows mutual constraint satisfaction and uh, utilization of context to the fullest possible extent. So these are some of the reasons why I think this is powerful. It's sort of like at the core of what was missing, we thought, from good old-fashioned AI was this ability to exploit context in this flexible and nuanced way, which you can learn gradually from optimizing your predictions over a huge corpus. Uh, and in the Burt style models, it captures this in a, in a way that I think Rummelhart would have really, really been pleased by. Okay. So how is this innovation used? We train a huge language model to predict the sequences of words in text with as many connection weights as possible and as much text as possible. And we run this for as long as possible. And you know, there's whole papers in the literature about how you trade off the amount of text, the number of connection weights, and the amount of training, and what's the optimal mixture of those things. You know, if you've got a limited computational budget or something like that, how do you trade this stuff off? There's papers about this. Uh, um, but there's an alignment problem. Next word prediction is not the same as what Altman was talking about, which is like doing what we want. We want it to do what we want it to do, not just predict the next word in some discourse, right? So GPT models and other models attempt to solve this problem by fine tuning the model with expert, so they give the model, they give people instructions, they ask people, the cute example was explain reinforcement learn to, learning to a six-year-old. Okay, they give that to a human expert, the human expert says, we give rewards and punishment to the system to make it do what we want, or something like that. That's the expert, and then you fine-tune the model so that when it's given that instruction, it gives that answer. Okay, so now it's instruction following. Uh, but that's very costly to get all this expert sort of, you know, um, rollouts of expert performance. So instead, we often uh, use RL models. We often um, get the model to generate something, and then we get humans to say whether they like what the model generated or uh, a human generated output or what compare two different model outputs and say which one it liked better. And then we reinforce the model for the one the human liked better. Or we even train another model to mimic the human's judgments so that we can then use that model to train the base language model to satisfy the critic model that mimicked humans' judgments of what they liked better. But we're still ultimately using the exact same learning mechanisms, supervised fine-tuning with, you know, 
in this context, you produce this sequence of tokens, or, oh, this was better than that, do this instead, upweight that, and downweight the other thing. Okay? It's all gradient based learning, and it's all very slow. And uh, it's part of the problem, I think. Okay. Um, so this is how it's currently done, and this is what OpenAI has been doing a lot of, and they have many innovations along these kinds of lines, and everybody else is following suit these days and doing similar things. Um, and, you know, these models, as I've already mentioned, they have huge depth. They have maybe 96 layers of transformers stacked on each other, each of which has 96 of those query key value sort of attention heads looking at the past in 96 different ways at each of 96 different layers of this huge, deep, deep, deep neural network uh, across up to 32 or even more uh, tokens of prior context. And this goes through some of those uh, optimizations I was describing, so I won't go through it again. And they even do pretty well. So here's, I got the next couple of examples from GPT-4 right after it came out in March. And uh, so I asked GPT-4, what is the derivative of the function x squared over c squared divided by 1 plus that same quantity x squared over c squared with respect to x? Sorry, this may be a little bit small for you to read. Um, I was impressed for several reasons. First of all, it gave me a pretty structured overall presentation, beginning with a high-level statement of the way to break the problem down into parts to make it easier to solve. It said, to find the derivative of this function with respect to x, we can first simplify the function by substituting u equal x squared over c squared. It noticed that there was a repetition of this expression. So f of u equals u over 1 plus u. Then we can find the derivative with respect to u and finally substitute back to find the derivative with respect to x. And then it says, well, let's find the derivative of u with respect to u. We can use the quotient rule. It cites a rule. It's doing what Fodor wanted, uh, which states that g of u equals u uh, over uh, Never mind, we're not going to go through the details of that. I find myself getting a little bit confused to say this all quickly. I think it's all exactly correct. Sometimes these models do make mistakes, but in the end, it did get the right answer. And again, it also invoked another rule, a very famous and crucial and important aspect of differential calculus, which actually was at the heart of backpropagation, namely the chain rule. Gradient descent is based on the chain rule. And it applied it in this case, and it got the right answer. So very good work. Here's another example, reasoning about grids. I'm interested in whether these models can be grounded a little bit, so, um, and whether they can have abstract understanding. And so I asked it, can you define the concept of diagonal adjacency for me? And it did a good job. It said diagonal adjacency, diagonal adjacency refers to the relationship between two cells in a grid that are next to each other along a diagonal line. In other words, two cells are diagonally adjacent if they share a common corner, but do not share any edges or sides. And, it, and then it goes through a more example. Uh, that seems pretty good, but now I'm going to show you a mistake. So I asked it a follow-up question. Can you place one x in each row and column of a 4x4 four four grid without any of the x's being adjacent? horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. And said, yes, it's possible to place one x in each row and column of a 4 by 4 grid without any of the x's being adjacent, horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. Here's one possible solution. What do you think? Can you see those x's? Or any adjacent diagonally? It's wrong about this, right? That is not an example of a grid in which one x has been placed in each row uh, of the grid 
each row and column of the grid without any of them being adjacent uh, diagonal. And then I said, oh, then it said, in this arrangement, none of the x's are adjacent in any direction, meaning the specified conditions. Pretty impressive, but it's actually wrong. So I said, your grid seems to be, have diagonally adjacent x's in the second and third rows. Do you agree? Oh, apologies for my mistake. <laughs> oh, you're correct. You humans are always right with open AI, right? We're always right in the end. It never tells us we're wrong unless we find a tortuous path into the inner, inner depths of these models, weights or something, and reveal Sydney who's hiding inside somewhere. But, uh, it, it's, you know, it's fine-tuned to, to admit its fallibility when challenged. And so it says, you're correct. My previous example does, does have diagonally adjacent x's in the second and third rows. So I actually didn't, yeah, I did say that. Yeah, I, I shouldn't have, I should have made it so that it had to figure out which rows they were in for me, but it, I told it that, so maybe it's just sort of parroting me at this point. And then it says, unfortunately, it's not possible to place x's in a four by four grid without any of them being adjacent, horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. And um, that's where I ended the conversation. But, um, just to convince myself that it was wrong again, I created this grid for myself. If you allow the edges of this to wrap, then it doesn't work. The second and third rows are still adjacent diagonally if you allow wrapping, but if you don't allow wrapping, it satisfies the condition. Okay, so what are the limitations of these systems? We sometimes write plausible sounding but incorrect or nonsensical answers. They're sensitive to tweaks in the input phrasing. Um, ideally, the models would ask clarifying questions. Instead, our current models usually guess. And I would add the models can express great confidence in a completely nonsensical answer or explanation. Um, okay, so how do we so there's two approaches to this, right? One is to keep scaling up and keep using reinforcement learning and, and um, you know, mutation learning, next token prediction type tasks with text strings that you want the model to imitate. But the other approach is, well, what is the other approach? So, yeah, is it just a matter of scaling up? Well, they scaled up the hot air balloon, not thinking that the airplane would ever fly. And this is what they got, right? The Hindenburg disaster in 1936. But maybe we need something different. Um, sort of like the Wright Brothers airplane. We don't know what it is yet. We, we've got what we've got now, and we can't quite see what that other thing would be. And so we prove theorems that it couldn't exist. So I don't know know whether scaling up is the final answer, but I tend to think um, we should look elsewhere. And so uh, my theme, the theme of what I'm trying to accomplish is to think more about how we can capture intelligence at the level of thought. Okay. So I now realize I have subjected myself to one of my own fallibilities, which is I've spent too long in the lead up to my core ideas. And I want to figure out how much more time I have to talk about what, you know, the solution rather than the setup of the problem to be, to be solved. So what do you think? How much more time? How much do you need? <laughs> well, uh, if I had another 20 minutes, I could probably give you the core ideas. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thing. Okay. I, sometimes people give me 90 minutes, sometimes they only give me 45, and I often forget to check. So apologies if you all, anybody who needs to leave like after an hour or something, of course, I'll understand if you have other obligations. Okay, so um, my principal thesis for you here is that uh, cognition, communication, and goal-directed action and often what we call learning, occur at the level of thought. So, um, for example, the first time I gave this talk, 
I was supposed to speak at 4.15 p.m. Central Standard Time uh, in New Orleans at the NERPS meeting in um, uh, like November 30th. Uh, maybe it was December 1st. But I knew what day it was. That wasn't in the message. And the message I got uh, said uh, that I should bring my laptop with me and directly plug it in at the podium. And they said to please come at least five minutes before the scheduled time so that everything runs smoothly. Um, and, you know, I used this information to organize my thinking. I'm sort of a last minute kind of person. And I was in my hotel room the morning of this talk. And, oh, I really wanted to go and hear the other talks, but I hadn't finished preparing my own. And so I needed to figure out exactly when I had to leave my hotel room to get there so that I was five minutes before 4.15. And I found, I, I actually walked all the way down there and back while I was thinking about my talk and figured out that it took 25 minutes. So I had to leave by 3.45 to be five minutes ahead. And it was beautiful because I got there just five minutes ahead. And the previous speaker had finished his talk and nobody asked any questions. So they said, okay, well, we'll just go on. And I got, I started five minutes early actually. So, but, but the main point here is that I'm using this content of this, these statements to guide my thinking in terms of uh, what I consider to be thought like uh, ideas uh, or representations and my experiences at the level of thoughts and what thoughts these, these thoughts imply about other thoughts, something like modus ponens, uh, you know, if I know that something implies something else and I know that the antecedent is true, then I can conclude the consequent. Um, and so I still think that those neural networks are a really important foundation for this, but that our thoughts are actually like the things that uh, Fodor, at least, was talking about um, in, his, in his writings. Um, so, uh, you know, I feel like I think at this level, I com we communicate with each other at this level, we try to make sure the other person gets what we're saying at the level of understanding the particulars of the relationships we're trying to describe. We formulate goals in this way. My goal is to get there at a specific time, okay? And we think about how to achieve them at this level. It takes 25 minutes, so I have to leave, you know, plus five minutes for being there five minutes early. So I have to do that arithmetic. And then I have a, a new sub-goal, which is to leave the hotel room at a certain time. Uh, and what we ordinarily mean by learning involves updating our stored repository of thoughts. So, um, you know, recently the Queen of England died and her son, Prince Charles, became the king of England. And so now if anybody asks me, well, who's the monarch of England? I should say Prince Charles. It was recently revealed in a paper that came out um, last week that these models, these language models, that they learn to predict, you know, that the that king, the Prince Charles is now the King of England. If you asked them, who is the King of England, they wouldn't know the answer. Because they'd just been doing that's called the reversal curse. Right? You could teach them. Joe is the president of the Ford Motor Company, but if you say then, who's the president of the Ford Motor Company, they won't say Joe. Because when you fine tuning the weights, it's doing next step prediction, and it doesn't know how to go from that other order of things to that. So there's actually something very brain damaged about what's going on in these neural networks that are just doing this forward prediction. And actually, this, so this concept of the reversal curse is actually a good way of contrasting what happens in our own minds when we understand relative to, you know, what actually happens in neural networks where we fine tune the weights to do some particular task. Um, so I suggest that we'll create effective intelligent assistants faster if we design and train them to operate at the level of thought. 
Uh, I argued that formal education may be an important vehicle through which this process is set in motion. And I also think that new architectures are likely to be needed too, and we should encourage their exploration. And so um, I said these things in this very brief paper that appeared last December in Trends in Cognitive Sciences, in case you'd like to see something uh, short and sweet to, that addresses these things. But uh, you're probably asking yourself, what does he mean by thought? And um, so I'm going to try to convey this to you briefly. Um, I think about thoughts as being about entities and situations. So here's an example of a sentence. John picked, I'm supposed to say an apple, and gave it to Mary. Um, this sentence is describing a situation. Okay, a situation involving a small number of participants in which uh, maybe an action or two occurs, causing some possible change in some aspects of the situation. So in this case, Mary now has an apple at the, as a result of this, of this sentence. And so what I'm imagining is that when you hear that sentence, or when you see somebody reach up and pick an apple from a tree and then hand it to somebody else, you know, you're forming a representation of that event, either from the sentence or from watching it, and that language is just one of the ways we have of communicating information about situations. So situations can often be about the meanings of words. So this word actually doesn't mean what you think it does. It means this instead. That's a situation about meanings of words. We can communicate that with each other as well. Words are entities, and their meanings are other entities, and the, the you know, the meaning of this word is that is a relationship between a word and a meaning. So the entities can be abstractions. And of course, in language classes, we get taught about those kinds of things all the time. So we can have explicit thoughts about these things. Uh, and uh, this is part of what it means. You know, when we learn in French class that uh, élève uh, means uh, the other students in the classroom, les élèves, I remember that was one of the first sentences of French, je vois les, les élèves et le professeur, and I learned that the word élève meant students. Um, that was an explicit uh, thought. But we're always picking out aspects of situations. It's important that we don't ever represent the situation as such. We represent it as construed. And so this, this action of picking the apple and giving it to Mary involves um, all kinds of like leaving details out, right? If, if he actually reached into the tree and picked the apple, probably the branch shook, maybe another apple fell, maybe some petals fell from leaves or something like that to the ground as well. Uh, and, you know, there was a particular way in which he did this, but so we've abstracted away from a lot of those things. Um, and we've construed them in ways that are related to our cultures and our contexts. And, uh, you know, we also rely on conventions, such as the conventions conveyed by our clocks and our time systems. Uh, and I've tried to capture that there. So, so there's a huge amount of learning that goes into understanding what it is that's being described and a huge amount of structured, uh, culturally structured constructs like the way we measure time that uh, influence our thoughts. And many of these things are communicated largely through language, but we're always thinking about situations, not just linguistic expressions. Okay. I'm going to use up my, have I used up my 20 minutes yet? No. <laughs> okay. So this one I'm just going to try to be really brief, but thoughts are like tips of icebergs, right? In your mind, when you understand that sentence about John picking the apple and, and giving it to Mary, I didn't mention a tree, but there was probably a tree lurking in the background and partly activated in the cut. 
I don't know uh, if it's true for many of you, but sometimes you might even imagine that uh, you were wondering whether Mary's boyfriend was watching this event. Um, because if, it, if he was, then there might be a social situation here that was developing that might be a little bit complicated. And so if I just said in the next sentence, Mary's boyfriend was watching, you would, it would sort of be latently ready to, to understand that sentence and then start thinking about the way in which these two things interlocked with each other to create that social situation. So I always think these things are part of, the thought itself is captured in a sentence like compression, but it's penumbra. And this is why I think it still has to be a distributed representation. It has to have this graded, continuous content to it. Um, but uh, it, it nevertheless sort of is somehow the unit in our mind, right, that, that we treat as a kind of a, kind of a unit. So one little specific implication of this part of the conversation, which I will just give you as a thought in case you're like, how would I ever use this in a machine learning system, would be to say, wouldn't it be worth exploring the possibility that we should train these models to, to kind of like build chunk-like representations of sentence-like units somewhat more explicitly than they do now. Instead of having 30,000 kind of word part level tokens in our context, what if we imagined that we had only, um, you know, 10 sort of thought level chunks in our, in our context window? And when we're, we're querying these 10 or so recent thought level or maybe sentence level units and we could easily you know uh, improve on our language possibly improve or explore improving on our language models by just having a tokenizer that adds to the tokens one token for every word part tokens for boundaries between thoughts periods of course are used in printed language to convey the boundaries between thoughts and if the sentences are too long, maybe we can, you know, find other ways of breaking them into pretty good approximations of thought-like units. And then we have an automatic way of beginning to explore this uh, within the structure of these models as they already exist. That's the kind of thing that a, a connectionist like me would like, right? It's not like we're getting rid of connectionism, but we're making them, making it more thought-like. Okay, so that's a little nugget. That's, of course, not completely satisfactory, right? Because it isn't rounded. It's just in the text stream. And so maybe we could talk. This group that I hang around with is the grounded language team at, at DeepMind. Uh, and so um, when we talk in the afternoon, we can talk about really making these things be about the situations, not just you know, abstractions out of the language itself. Okay. Um, so I think I've covered most of this. Um, so here are two themes that I'm exploring um, beyond what I've just said. Giving them better grounding by integrating multiple modalities and making them more intrinsically goal-directed. Okay, so in the last six minutes, to skip over some stuff here. I'm going to show you a little task that I taught myself to perform and that I discussed a little bit with one of my students as I was learning to perform it and he gave me some ideas about how I could do better at it and um, uh, I'll leave this kind of with you in your minds as the context for maybe a few questions if we still have time. We have time, we have time. Great. So, uh, this puzzle appeared in the New York Times, which I'm a subscriber to, early in the pandemic. And I was at home, stuck there, couldn't go into the office, and feeling sorry for myself. So, I started um, working on these puzzles. 
And I, I want you to work on this puzzle too, okay? Because that's the point of this. I want you to engage in this puzzle at the level of thought, okay? So here's what I saw. I saw this grid. And I saw this instruction. Place two X's in each row, column, and bounded region in the grid. No two X's can be adjacent, not even diagonal. Maybe that's why I was asking GPT-4 about this. Okay? So, get started. Can anybody tell me where they might place X's to get started solving this problem? Blocks with only three. The blocks with only three cells in them. Um, okay, tell me why you think that. There's only one way to put two X's in a boundary if there are only three cells. Without touching. Without touching, right. Um, obviously, if you put one in the middle, the second one would have to be adjacent to it, right? So it can't be in the middle, and there's got to be two in there. So that's correct. And that is what somebody always says when I ask this question. Uh, I've given versions of this talk about eight times now, so I'm getting a reliable sample. Um, so that's something you can notice. And it's sort of magic how it's like you just look at it and you've read this instruction and somehow or other this idea comes to you. And I'm not sure how it comes to you. Maybe that really is some completely emergent process in a neural network-like system. But once it comes to you, you can use it and say, okay, well, let's see, are there any others of those things around in this grid? And then you can explicitly look for bounded regions that have exactly three uh, cells in them, either horizontally or vertically. Um, and so there are two of those. Um, and, you know, by doing things like this, you can get a little further if you think about it. Um, but there are other things you can notice where maybe you won't be able to place X's immediately, but you'll be able to rule out places where X's can't go. So, for example, if you look at the 4 by one region in the far edge of this, you know that two X's need to go in there, and that tells you there can't be any other X's in that whole column. And so, you know, you can't be sure where the X's do go in that region yet, but you can be sure there can't be any other X's in that column. And so it might occur to you at that point, I don't know how quickly it occurred to me, but at some point, maybe the first or second day, I formulated this explicit rule to myself. Oh, I shouldn't be trying to figure out where the X's can go. I should be trying to figure out where they can't go. And so I got, I started using my pencil not just to mark X's, but to put little dots in the cells where I knew the X's could not go. Now I have a new sub goal, which I can, I've just told you, find the places where the X's can't go, and that will build up additional constraints that will allow you to fully solve this problem. Um, and this is a very easy one, so I'm sure that everyone in the room with what we've said so far um, would be able to get to the solution. And it's a completely forward solution strategy. It doesn't involve any trial and error at all. Uh, and, you know, maybe you even knew this implicitly, and this is something that I find interesting as well. But this is what I do as a scientist. I make my intuitions explicit so that I can communicate them to other people. And that's what I'm trying to do with you all here, which is uh, sort of part of the metacognitive exercise of this whole talk. And the, sort of the meta... Well, I guess my whole quest in my entire career has been to understand my own mind, right? We were talking about what my goals, what people's goals were. I think that's been my goal for a long time. Anyway, so we get to the level of being able to have the goal of formulating explicit understandings of things that we can communicate to other people. 
as well as that we can use for problem solving. And um, so this is the combination of, this is where this goal-directedness idea comes in. I think that's so fundamentally related to what Pierre Yves and the whole group are working on here. So I'm really glad to be here to talk to you guys about it. Um, so I think I should wrap up pretty much here, but maybe I'll just sort of say a few of these things. I can, ex you know, we learn from instructions and self-instructions, and I'm just going to sort of remind you of a couple of the examples. We, um, we learn from an explanation of the task itself, which is a specification of the goal and relevant constraints. So that's what we're given here. We're given this instruction that we have to place two x's in each row, column, and box, and no two x's can be adjacent, not even diagonally, so that's what we're given, and then we use that to guide our thinking and our problem solving. We can point out or discover general rules that we can then exploit or other people can exploit. We can reconceptualize the goals or form sub-goals. And uh, we can identify a sub-goal state that's desirable to reach and explain why it is useful to other people. And all these kinds of things are things that we do in grounded situations, interacting with each other towards building better situation models and a deeper understanding of the world we live in. So that when somebody tells us that the former Prince Charles is now the King of England, we have some sort of thought-like representation that's able to uh, be used to answer the question, well, now who is the current King of England? Um, okay, so I think I better stop there. And thank you for uh, your attention. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts about thoughts. Any questions? Yes. I was wondering if you think that there's some relationship between thoughts and symbols in like good old fashioned AI. Would you say that yeah, it's like totally different? This paper by DeepMind in one about symbolic behavior in AI. Uh -huh. I was proposing that symbols are socially constructed. Socially constructed? Yeah, they're like things that have meaning. Uh, to another. So to me, it sounds like there's some relationship there. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I definitely think that symbols are socially constructed, uh, culturally constructed, constructed by societies of scientists and thoughtful scholars who are trying to develop systematic ways of thinking about things that are effective and powerful tools for supporting our thinking. And, um, you know, number systems are like that, right? And the, the history of number systems is that, you know, until, I don't know, less than a thousand years ago, right? In Europe, the number systems that people were using didn't have the place value notation built into them. They were, they were using things more like Roman numerals, which, which like, say, you got this many thousands and this many hundreds and this many tens and this many fives and this many ones. But it wasn't as easy to compute with as the base 10 system with the places and values. And that, of course, was developed uh, elsewhere. Then it came to Europe and it became a very powerful tool and it allows, you know, the invention of computing systems um, that are very systematic and, you know, allow you to repeatedly execute the exact same computation at each column of a place value arithmetic um, addition problem or something uh, in, a, in a way that is fully systematic and does preserve actual validity against the facts of the matter, right? So when you add up several five-digit numbers according to the algorithm of arithmetic, you actually get the correct sum. And if that represented dollars or euros or, or 
numbers of sheep that people had, you'd actually have a valid answer at the end of this. But the whole system is socially constructed and uh, or culturally, you know, by groups of people, right? Euclid probably wasn't one person. That's one idea. He was a committee of people in Alexandria who were trying to develop a systematic set of understandings. And they developed reasoning systems involving proof and things like that out of the prior ideas of others that were nascently moving in that direction. So the emergence of these systems are themselves interesting sort of, you know, emergent processes. Um, but they then become these powerful tools. And I, I just think that Fodor had been so deeply immersed in these powerful tools, thinking the way people like Frege and other philosophers had been thinking at the end of the 19th century, that it was like, to him, it had to be true that this was the actual fundamental fabric of thought, as opposed to a set of tools that humans developed to allow us to structure our thought. Is that related to your question? <laughs> I'm going to sit down because I have this little hernia yeah. problem. Yeah. And it'll be easier if I do that. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we have a question on the. Richard, there are a few ones. Uh, someone, Karen Behar, is asking Are thoughts sequential or can be incursive in nature? Um. So I want you guys to help me with this one. I, I think um, thoughts are not sequential. I think a thought is, is like a coherent mental state, which involves a, appreciation of a relationship or something like that. Um, like when you think about F equals MA, there's a relationship between three entities that's expressed by that. And, um, you know, like, I think that took Newton a long time to get to that crystallization of that, those, the, those constructs and their relationship to each other. And he had these nascent sort of like intuitions. There was a relationship like that that he needed to find. And it was guiding his thinking for a long time. So I think our intuitions can give us a sense that there's some something to discover. Something that, like Darwin, you know, sorry, I've got to push this thing in, then I'll be able to talk to you. One second. <laughs> it actually works better if I'm standing up. Let me do that, and then... What if you prefer? Oh, okay. All right, that, now I can sit down and it won't pop back up again. Right. So, um, when Darwin came along, it was at a time when people had just become people in science, you know, had just become kind of pretty clearly convinced that the world had existed for a lot more than 6,000 years, which is what it says in the Bible. And that gave time for evolution. He knew that other people had been thinking about the question, well, how could traits evolve? And... He read what they said about it, and he didn't um, find what they said, like, convincing. It seemed sort of circular to him and things like that. Like, you know, the, the um, transmission of, of learned traits to offspring didn't seem like it could actually be totally valid. So he needed another mechanism for thinking about how this could occur. And he went on a long quest for this. It spent, he spent many, many years thinking about the problem. You know, he sailed around the world drawing pictures of birds and things like this and thinking about this and 
looking at these birds and seeing how similar they were to each other. They got to be related. It must have happened by some sort of evolving process, but not really quite having the mechanism. And then he read Malthus, and Malthus sort of had this idea that, you know, populations expand until they run out of resources and then and then they get limited by the resource running out and and then there's people die off and he was really fascinated by this but he didn't know how to use it quite so i have this feeling that there was some incipient subliminal kind of sense that that was going to turn out to be relevant for solving the problem of how evolution could occur and um but it didn't it didn't quite gel right so he he had to keep thinking about it but he kept thinking along those lines so i i feel like we we have these intuitions these subliminal feelings that you know finally eventually can get crystallized in some explicit thoughts and in darwin's case it was pretty simple at the end of the day right that competition for resources results in selection of those who have slightly better ability to exploit them compared to others. And, you know, that's how natural selection works, right? You, you have random um, variation and selection under competition for resources. And that's a, that's a theory of evolution. So it becomes explicit after sort of bubbling around in the back of your mind for a long time, while you're also goal-directedly seeking a way to make it explicit. So, so um, but I don't think, yeah, we, we have to write a sentence down in, in a certain order, but of course, in a mathematical expression, you know, the expression sits on the page and the relationships are you know, and with the equal sign, of course, you could write something on either side of the equal sign. You'd be still looking at the same expression. And so I think there's something beautiful and natural about that. But, you know, I also think that that that's if if you memorize a song or a poem, you've got the reversal curse. You can't recite it backwards. You can only recite it forwards. Right. And um, so we do have an element of that sort of explicit sort of memorization of sequences. And that that actually, you know, is a, a hugely important thing before people had writing. They 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 had ways of using rhyme and, and rhythm, you know, to to pro provide a lot of mnemonic kind of cons a lot of constraints that would make it easier to remember things because it had to fit the rhythm and it had to match the rhyme and it had to also be consistent with the story. And that, that really helps you to have enough constraints to be sure you remember correctly what the actual lines of the poem were. But then of course the, the actual content of the story is, is also very important, but that's at a different level. From Frédéric Alexandre. Okay. One question from Frédéric Alexandre. Uh, one of your major contributions is also the complementary learning system that you don't mention here, whereas it might be a major way to address issues you mentioned by improving and accelerating the learning of this grid of knowledge. What do you think? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the complementary learning system theory is um, a theory that says that when we initially learn new things, like um, Prince Charles is now the King of England, uh, we don't actually adjust the weights in our deep neural networks that are underlying our ability to quickly produce speech or understand the flow of information as it's rapidly coming in. but we sort of store a representation of that in a special part of our brain called the hippocampus. And uh, this is something that neuroscientists, um, you know, if you lose your hippocampus, if it's removed on both sides of your brain because a very aggressive surgeon decided that in your case, it would be a good idea to remove the hippocampus on both sides of your brain, um, 
you would, and you'd learned that, like, let's say a month ago, and you had your hippocampus removed on both sides of your brain, you would not know that information anymore. So we first store these things in a way that's sort of more explicit like, and um, it's also true. I remember I mentioned this reversal curves. Um, it doesn't happen if I give you the information in context, right? It's only if we fine tuned it into the connection weights of the system that you get that reversal curse effect. But if I say, Prince Charles is now the King of England, and then I say a few more things, and I say, oh, um, who did I say was now the King of England? The model would be able to tell me that it's Prince Charles. So somehow or other, the context, using the information in context, doesn't have the reversal curse. Maybe it has it a tiny bit, but hardly, not at all relative to the what happens when you do the fine tuning. So my way of thinking is that, okay, we just need that idea I was describing about making these thought-like units in the, in the context. Let's store those in the episodic memory and make it so that we, we usually have you know, a few of them in immediate context in an active state. And these amnesics can actually reason with a few premises in an active state. Um, but if they go out of mind, they just lost it. They can't. So what we do is we store these things. And then we, we sort of have this hippocampus that is, is like all the rest of the uh, tokens uh, beyond the immediate limited human context window of a small number of them. Um, and then I'm, so that's a solution. And once, so one idea is that really a huge amount of our learning is at that level. We're storing these thought like units and then being able to bring them back and use them to guide our thinking. Eventually, we do proceduralize, we sort of develop, you know, when I play the two not touch game now, I don't have to think consciously about a lot of this stuff. It's much quicker, more automatized. Maybe it's routinized in a way that's like consolidating it into the into the weights <clears throat> gradually. But I still have the, the access to this sort of thought level units as well, right? And so these things could work together and, and solve this problem, I think. Yeah. So I totally agreed with the, with the comment. Thank you. Question in the room? We pick up another question. Go, 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 go back from the previous group. Uh, is the mechanism for thinking about social problems or situations for example, theory of mind, fundamentally different from a mechanism for thinking about regular associal physical problems. So I think that's a great question. Um, and uh, I don't really fully know the answer to it, but uh, one, one thing I would say is that brains are you know, we, we have different patches of our brain that are involved in representing different aspects of things. So there's patches that represent the colors of things and others that represent, you know, where the patterns of activation seem to correspond to our representation of how the thing moves, right? And so, or another part where we represent what, how we would act on some object to use it for its purpose. And these are distinct parts of the brain that can be damaged separately and they can, you know, make it so that you can't, no, you no longer can represent from a visual input uh, or any other input, you know, the color that something has because you've lost the population of neurons that represents that those aspects of an object. Uh, so in the same way, you know, I think there could be s sort of parts of the brain that might have something to do with representing things like 
other people's beliefs. So it's it's not like there wouldn't be some degree of modularity of that in terms of where those patterns of activations are. But at the same time, I don't necessarily think that means that the principles that govern our learning about it and our ability to control our thoughts about those things based on our goals and so on are completely separated from uh, some sort of more global sort of cognitive control system. And so one idea is that, you know, throughout our brain, we have many little sub modules that we can bring together to do arbitrary kinds of things. And we have another set of brain regions whose job it is to like coordinate their mutual engagement in service of goals. Um, and so there, there's a man whose name is John Duncan, who is um, a, a, a person who's been studying what he calls the multi-demand network in the brain for a very long time. And I, I just had the chance uh, two weeks ago to visit with him and learn about the way his group thinks about these things. The way they think about it is that they're all over the brain. There are these regions that are representing specific kinds of information, like sensory information in different modalities or slightly more abstract representations from those modalities or actions at different levels of abstraction and so on. And, you know, other parts that are involved in actually retrieving information from the hippocampus and bringing it into context and so on. And if you're going to, and, and there's this also this multi-demand network, it's actually not just a single region. People used to think of it as being in the prefrontal cortex, but now his group says it's actually like nine regions distributed throughout different higher order parts of the cortex such that they communicate with each other so the goals are shared across the whole system and then they modulate the activity of the relevant regions nearby to control them in service of these broader goals of the whole system and um so so th that's the sense in which i think that our brains are sort of modular systems and that, and that's one of the kinds of architectural innovations that um i think might turn out to be worth having in these models. They have no separate cognitive control systems. They're just just transformers, right? They're just doing next token prediction the whole time. The engineers are doing all kinds of crazy things with them, though. They're, they're doing multiple rollouts and looking at which one is better or something like that. And maybe our, our cognitive control system is the system we have that allows us to do a few little rollouts to check alternative ways of solving a particular problem. Um, and that's how we internalize the things that are now mostly still being done by the engineers and not in the system itself. So I like to say that all the goals that artificial intelligence systems have are still in the, in the mind of the CEO of the company and not, not, the, uh, not the neural network itself. Thank you. Is this a good place to stop, do you think? Or if you wish. If you wish. I just want to make sure I'm not trapping people here. Uh. <laughs> there is a, a door. Okay, thank you, Lucas. <laughs> uh, it's great. I, 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 I love to keep talking. I just, I just, uh, I just, if anybody in the audience, you know, has a, well, when I was a graduate student, I remember that I used to, this is related to the question before about the th thoughts being sequential. I wanted to speak up in class, and there were these two other PhD students in my year as a first year student who were, they'd been studying cognitive psychology for a lot longer than I have, and they, they had much better developed thoughts about it. And they were always dominating the discussion. I wanted to get into the discussion. So what I would do is I would raise my hand when I thought maybe there was something in my mind that I could flesh out as a thought if I only got called upon to speak. And so occasionally I would get called upon and I would say, uh, <laughs> and then I would force myself to get this out and then I would hear what I had to say, you know, and it would be like that incipient thought that suddenly becomes a, an expressed idea. 
if anybody has one in the audience, I certainly welcome it. There's another one online. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Alex Tech, <coughs> former PhD student of yours. What you said about people having intuitions about the existence of some kind of relationship between concepts reminds me of knowledge gaps uh, in theories about semantic networks. It is one thing to search for information given a gap, but it's another thing to find a gap itself. Do you have any intuitions about how such gaps arise or are detected in a cognitive system? Uh, I, I think probably I'm definitely on extremely speculative ground at this point. Um, I think I would say that uh, a lot of it is somehow or other in the air. Um, and of course, that's not an explanation, but, you know, lose. Newton and Leibniz both invented the calculus at roughly the same time. And um, although it was a prodigious feat in both cases, there must have been something about the state of knowledge that existed at that time that made it possible for them to sort of have the sort of the, the incipient tools that could then be brought together to solve these problems. And um, I also think about this in relation to Rummelhart deriving back propagation. Um, you know, back propagation is really nothing more than applying the chain rule to ask the question what's the partial derivative of some error measure with respect to a connection weight? And there's all these units and additional connection weights between you and the error. It's just this, there's just a chain of little relationships there, each of which you have to think through its derivative to get the derivative all the way back. So Rumblehart, of course, knew about the chain rule, and he's listening to Jeff Hinton tell him that, and he wanted to solve the negation problem. And, you know, he, we, we realized uh, at that point that you, we could teach a neural network to to adjust connections from a set of units to a set of out, set of input units to a set of output units using this error correcting learning rule. But we didn't know how to train the connection weights further back from the, the next to last layer. And he just like said, okay, well, okay, we're gonna do gradient descent. Jeff made that point, that's a good idea. And I need to figure out how to do that. And you, it's the derivative of something with respect to something else. Uh, and I just need to ha figure out how to take the derivative of the connection weight back here instead of the connection weight here. How do I do that? And he, his paper about that is really just working through those ideas and writing down the expressions to then show us what those derivatives are. And so he called it the generalized delta rule, and he thought of it as passing error signals back to the hidden units so that the hidden unit would now have a signal which was similar to the one that the output unit had directly based on the difference between the teaching signal and the activation. And, and so he was, he was connecting ideas that were already there together to work through this process of figuring out what the derivative would be for the connection weight from the input to the hidden layer, rather than just from the hidden layer directly to the output layer of his network. And uh, and then, of course, he realized that, that you could iterate that backwards through as many layers as you wanted once you got the basic idea. So um, why am I telling you all this? I guess it's to say that the gap was somehow pretty clear and as soon as he started thinking, well, I want to do negation and the linear direct connections can't really do negation properly. So how am I going to solve that problem? And then, yeah, so, so that was the gap that he identified. And I think Darwin identified the gap of, okay, evolution 
I really believe that evolution must have occurred. Now, how the hell did it happen, right? And, and uh, so I think these things, they become, if, if you're immersed in the question and you know all the people who've been writing about the, the related ideas, you sort of, you're, you're in a position to see what that question is. Uh, of course, you, you need to be goal-directed about it, but um, yeah. Okay, thank you. So I propose that we uh, conclude here. Uh, we'll have opportunities to further discuss in the team this afternoon. So thank you everyone again for coming and a special thanks to Clément Boulafrier for uh, uh, making most of the job of the organization of the seminar this morning. Uh, yeah. So, thank you again.